This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. Mino Studio is a pre- and post-production facility for all of your audio needs. Mino Studio's founder is an accredited audio engineer with top 40 and indie album credits. With over 30 years of music industry experience, Mino Studio can take your podcast from idea to reality. Contact Mino Studio at Mino Studio 777 at gmail.com for more information. That's Mino Studio 777 at gmail.com. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. I am here with Joe Fairless and real, real excited to have him on our broadcast number 001 for the Old Dogs REI Network. And Joe is a good friend, a mentor, and someone I think that all of us are going to value listening to and uh, get a lot of great information from. Uh, Joe is the principal at Fairless Investing and the host of the extremely popular leading iTunes real estate podcast show, Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever. And he started buying multifamily properties in 2013 and now controls over $28 million worth of real estate in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Houston, and Cincinnati. And what is amazing is the fact that he achieved this in just three years, expanding so much. Although he had invested as early as 2008 in single family homes, most of the growth that's happened with his business has been within the last three years. Uh, prior to that, he was the youngest vice president at an award winning advertising agency in New York City. He has a current, its latest acquisition in terms of. His uh, real estate business has been a 155-unit apartment community in Houston, and he also currently consults other investors on multifamily investing. I happen to be also one of those investors. Um, as the host of the popular show, Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, uh, which happens to be the world's longest-running daily podcast. Uh, he has interviewed guests such as Barbara Corcoran from the popular show Shark Tank and Robert Kiyosaki, author of the leading real estate investor book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, he is a strong advocate of giving back and serves on the alumni advisory board for Texas Tech University and the board of directors of Junior Achievement in Cincinnati. And I also understand he is writing a book, his first book, uh, due to come out soon. Hopefully, he'll tell us a little bit about that as well. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce you to Joe Fairless. Hi, Joe. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Really nice to be on the show. And number 001, what an honor. <laughs> well, uh, it's I, I guess it comes with its pluses and its minuses. Uh, any kind of glitches here, probably you'll be the first to experience. So <laughs> I apologize for that. Hey, I understand you should listen to some of my first episodes and then compare them to the episodes I've got now. Um, I don't know if I've gotten any better, but certainly the sound stuff has. And uh, you're starting a lot better than I am. I was recording my first one on uh, cell phone to cell phone, which just wasn't wasn't the right approach. Wow. Yeah, well, that, hopefully Skype works better here. Um, it sounds like we got a great connection, so I'm excited about that. 
Cool. Well, Joe, there's a lot that's happened in your life and a lot of great information to share. Uh, maybe you could just kind of, you know, from your own words, just kind of uh, let us know about how you got into the uh, real estate investing business. Sure. And should we start off with like a bark or something to go with the format of the theme of your show? Or how, how do we do that? <laughs> well, this is a, I was going to ask you at the end of the show, actually, <laughs> Joe, um, that you, you have to give me at least one good old hound dog howl. <laughs> That's at okay. the end? That'll yeah, at the end. Okay. So, all right, all right. Stay uh, you know, tuned, I everyone. I don't want to do mine you know, to show you. I don't want to show you up on this one, okay, Joe. So, fair enough. So you've <laughs> got to give me a good howl at the end of the show, okay? I love it. I love it. <laughs> all right. Well, a little bit about me before I get into my howl. howl um, I, As you mentioned, I started investing in multifamily in 2013, January of 2000. Well, I, I bought my first place in July of 2013, but I started studying it in October of 2012, um, I was currently, at, well, at that time, I was a vice president, the youngest vice president of a New York City advertising agency, um, but I just wasn't fulfilled, wasn't digging it, decided to leave the industry. I had four single-family home, homes at the time living in New York City, but investing in Dallas-Fort Worth, where I'm from, um, and... I uh, decided to take the plunge. I and I got a cash out refinance on one of my homes. Um, got fifty thousand dollars in the bank. Decided to uh, use that money to start my own company. And um, the money was dwindling, dwindling, dwindling until I ended up closing on my first deal, the hundred and sixty eight units. Um, at that point, I uh, waited. I mean, he, here's the thing. While it might appear when we look back on it as of today that it happened relatively quickly where I you know, now have you know, control $28 million worth of real estate. I actually waited two years after my first purchase to buy number two and number three. Number two was 250 unit. Number three was 155 unit. Uh, and now I have a 320 unit under contract in Carrollton, Texas, uh, as we speak, and I'm actually flying to Dallas tomorrow morning to go uh, do some due diligence because we, as I said, we have it under contract. So um, the it, it might seem like I've gotten where I'm at fast, but I think it's one thing that could get lost in it is that I waited two years from purchase one to purchase two so that I could acclimate myself to the system, make sure I know um, you know, the, the management approach, how to do the asset management, um, and just do the whole thing, uh, by myself from a asset manager standpoint. And then I brought on team members for the subsequent deals because I saw the things I was good at, things I wasn't as good at, and, uh, put some people in place who were better than me at those things I wasn't good at and helped me really, uh, focus on the stuff I, I do enjoy and I am good at. Well, that, that's great approach, and I think that's something I think listeners should really be aware of too. Is that there is a, a learning curve, and uh, you can go to all the seminars and the courses you want, but uh, it's not until you're in it that you really realize, you know, uh, what it's all about and what's required. Um, so I think that's a, a great approach. I, I I just wanted to take a step backward. You started off investing in single family homes. Uh, there must have been some point there where you. Uh, obviously changed your mind and uh, what what was it that's kind of sparked the the uh, move from single family to multifamily I was writing in a spreadsheet how many homes I needed to get in order to reach my financial goal and I was the like, coming across like hundreds of homes at $250 or I don't know how many it was I can't remember but it was more than 10 of homes that I have to buy in order to reach my goal and I realized I was like this just is going to take way too long I've already got four homes and it's a process to buy them with my own money and do all the paperwork find them buy them do all the paperwork oversee the management company on it taxes every year there's an HOA fee with one of them uh, write the insurance checks every year. It was just, it, it wasn't scaling. It, I knew there was a, there had to be a different approach. And, um, the benefit of multifamily is twofold. One is you're buying a bunch of them at once. And then two, you can raise money from investors, buy it with the investors so that you can 
a scale your business, you get part ownership in it, which is what I do. I put a little bit of my, my money in it, but the investors put uh, the rest, and uh, that allows me to scale my business and allows them to have a passive investment and invest in large stuff, whereas it, they might not have time to invest in large stuff because they're busy making their money on the full-time job. Yeah, and that what's interesting in this too, because you also bring in expertise when you're sort of solo buying single family homes. When I started off, that was the the challenge. You're pretty much in it by yourself for the most part, and and it's not often you get investors involved unless you're flipping or doing something else along those lines. But that does make a big difference when you've. You, got the expertise as part of your team. But one thing that's real interesting here is that I noticed you you didn't start small. I just start with a duplex or a fourplex or even, you know, 10, 15 units. And you started with 168 units? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a I mean, you dove in big time and uh you purposely doing that Did it just no. happen? Yeah, tell me no. what your thoughts were. I my thoughts were I would go from single family homes to a 30 unit buy it in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, raise about $250,000 for the deal. I quickly learned, well, over about a period of a month and a half, that I wasn't just wasn't finding anything in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time. This was in 2013, uh, the you know January f- or February, March of 2013. And, uh, you know, there just weren't any good deals that I could find, at least, living in New York City and, and looking in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So what I did is I uh, just kept at it, and by kept at it, I mean I was I was still speaking to professionals. I uh, knew a broker. He shared with me an opportunity that was on LoopNet, but it was in Cincinnati, and it looked good um, because we were going at it from a creative standpoint. Instead of buying it, you know, traditionally, you actually go in with a master lease with option to purchase, which uh, sidesteps the um, the bank qualification process, not entirely, but um, for a large part, you still have to get in writing. This is something, by the way, a lot of people who talk about the master lease, they don't mention this, and it's really important that everybody hears this. You still should get approval from the lender if you're doing a master lease, especially on an apartment community, because it might be written in the loan documents that that's not um, not okay to do, and if the lender ever catches wind of it, then they could call your note and um, and and make you pay it off immediately, um, which you know that would be trouble, and or uh, it might negate your transaction. And in my case, I raised um, over a million bucks uh, for the deal, and you know what happens? It's just court, you know, just get caught up in court. So always get the lenders written signature that it's it's you know they're they're okay with the deal but i was able to find this deal through the broker and we ended up working it out where originally it was 400k that i have to raise and i was like okay i'm i thought i could raise 250 i bet i can stretch myself to 400 well i got uh, more and more into the deal turns out and having to raise $843,000, which I did, plus I got the brokers to put in uh, their commission, which is $317,500 into it. So over a million bucks worth of equity that was being put into it. Um, And then there were some prorated taxes uh, and security deposits that that were taken into account um, for, for the down payment. So all in all, we ended up putting in about 1.3 million um, when all said and done, and it was a creative way of getting it done. I, if you had asked me uh, just straight up, hey, here's a 168 unit property, um, can you, you know, can you raise money f- to buy? I'm like, no, I, I can't. I, I will get there though someday, uh, but it just happened that the opportunity uh, bar was low enough. It was higher than I thought, but it was low enough where I thought it was attainable. Uh, then I was growing with the deal as the deal was evolving, and I ended up making it happen. 
Now we've got a lot of newbies listening and uh, I, I throw myself in that category too. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to take a step back real quick. Um, can you just define a master lease um, exactly, you know, again for, uh, you know, this is multifamily for dummies for me here. Yeah. So uh, um, how would you explain what a master lease is? Well, I'd say that a lot of, a lot of the listeners, you're probably aware of a lease option where you, on a single family house, uh, so I'll explain it that way because it's essentially the same thing. Lease option is where you, uh, you have a, you have control, you have, you own a house and then instead of putting in a renter, you choose to uh, lease to own to someone. So they make payments to you on a monthly basis uh, and those payments go towards the down payment that they will have to make, um, or they uh, they go towards rent, depending on you know however you structured it. But they are renting to own, so eventually their intent is to buy it, and they likely put a down payment on the property um, to do so. We did the same thing with this apartment community. We put a down payment up front of almost twenty percent, uh, factoring in the the uh, equity from the brokers. And then uh, as a result of putting that down payment, we now took over everything. We took over the income, we took over the expenses, and we took over the mortgage payments, also known as the debt service. And we made, we collected all the income and we're making all the payments on the expenses in the debt service. Uh, we get to keep the profits. And the beauty of it is that two things. One is we're not making any additional payments to the owner over the course of the the master lease. Uh, and then two is that we get the principal pay down uh, that's that's created from the mortgage payment. So let me let me break that down for you. Um, you know, the mortgage payment is mortgage taxes and insurance is about forty six, forty seven thousand dollars a mm -hmm. month. Uh, so some of that's taxes, some of it's insurance. Um, but the principal that's paid down every month is fifteen thousand dollars. So every single month that we have this, we're gaining fifteen thousand dollars in equity on the property uh, wow. to, over that's the great. course of the master lease. So even if we hold serve. You know, even if we don't improve the property, then we're still getting fifteen thousand dollars in equity every month that we have the property, uh, and we just so happen to have an exercise to buy the property at six point three five million, but it appraised at the time we closed for six point seven million. Wow! Now, is the is the deed in the still in the name of the seller uh, in the yeah. master lease? Yeah. Okay. So. And technically, they're still the owner. And and they're still the owner. Okay, we're just leasing, the, we're just leasing it from them, and we can exercise our option to purchase at any point in time within that window. So you just assume whatever the whatever the existing terms are on that uh, yes. loan. Okay, yep. gotcha. Wow, that uh, it it sounds like a, it's complicated, but it also sounds like it's just a a great uh, a great vehicle. Is this the only property that you've done the master lease on? Yes. Okay, great. Um, oh, interesting. And the other part of it is, other part of my question here is, and you just kind of threw this in, and to me it's a huge thing, is how did you get your your um, brokers to give up their commissions? Now, I, that, does, that sounds unheard of. Yeah, well, they, um, they wanted to get the deal done. The deal had a large prepayment penalty on it, about a million bucks, and uh, the interest rate on the loan was 6.19%. They got it at the at the wrong time. So they couldn't move the property unless they did something creative. And they recognized that they needed to get creative. And, you know, they still got, they still have equity in the property. Uh, okay, so, they, so, they, so you they, gave them like, equity. Yeah, they're, they're not forfeiting their money. They're just exchanging cash for equity in the property. Um, so they got 25, they got about, they got 25% ownership in the property. My side has 75% and I'm, I'm the guy who controls all 100% of it. Well, that's a very creative deal. What a great, uh, great first deal to do. My goodness. Uh, I don't know that I could do something that, that involved, but it sounds like, uh, uh, boy, it just really worked out well for everyone. Uh, that's neat. Looking at your 
you know, just the, the term that you've had now in your, in your real estate career, what would you say was the biggest mistake that you have made? And uh, with that, what, uh, you know, what did you learn from it? How could our listeners learn from what you experienced in that uh, as well? Oh, I've made a lot. And I'd say two big ones that I've made. Um, one is poor due diligence on the inspection for that 168 unit. And then two, and this is so stupid, but I did it. Uh, two is uh, raising money for the down payment, but not having an operating budget or a cushion for improvements that need to be made. And as you can imagine, the uh, poor due diligence and lack of an operating budget they're not a good combo. <laughs> Ooh, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're not they're not a good combo. So, um what I've learned from it now, well how I overcame that specific scenario and I is I put my own money into the deal after we closed. Um mm -hmm. so I didn't put any of my money in it at closing, but then once I saw, oh shoot. So nobody told me and it, this is my fault, but I I um wasn't aware and again, totally on me, but I wasn't aware that I needed to have an operating budget. It was stupid, such a stupid mistake, but I did it. Um, and so I ended up having to put my own money into the deal um, just to make sure things were turning around properly and the property was set up the correct way as it should be. Um, and so what we do now uh, with property, with our acquisitions, you know, we've we've bought, and I say we, it's my business partner and I. I did the first one by myself, but then um, part of the lesson I learned is that I want to focus on the things I'm good at, which is uh, raising money, marketing, and uh, identifying opportunities. And then my business partner is very good at underwriting those opportunities and then securing the debt financing for those. So I focus on the equity, he focused on the debt financing. Um, so uh, what I did to course correct is uh, now I have a business partner who is an all-star at underwriting and the due diligence process. And we just simply hired out too. We have a third party company they put together. I was just looking at it earlier a hundred page document on what they find whenever they go to the property. It costs like 4,000 bucks, um, depending on the size of the property and what they do. Uh, but we hire it out. And then, um, with the, you know, with, with the, the, the learnings that I had on the actual, um, raising money and, and making sure you have enough. Well, you just have an operating budget and, uh, you know, we just closed on 155 unit property, like two weeks ago and we have a hundred thousand dollar operating budget for the this you know just cash flow um, we also have a contingency fund of three hundred thousand dollars for any improvements that are needed on top of what we already have budgeted for so it's just you know it comes with experience and it comes with surrounding yourself with the right people if you don't have that experience so if those right people are telling you hey yeah you you got the money for down payment congratulations but Let's also make sure you have an operating budget as well as, uh, oh, shoot, this thing happened scenario um, and make sure you have money for that. Wow. You know, I think that the, that's a, a great message for many of the people that are listening to who are interested in real estate investing but don't really want to take, you know, years and years to learn. And uh, the one of the ways it looks like you, you made up for maybe the – years of studying and, and taking it one step at a time is by coming along somebody with the experience and uh, having that mentor is just key and a really important thing uh, for everybody involved. So uh, great, great, uh, great story. Uh, conversely, I want to look at sort of the biggest success. What would you say is a key event that really generated your biggest success as a real estate investor? Oh, I'd say the key is... Um... I, you know, I'd say probably my resourcefulness. There's all sorts of things that anybody's going to have to learn, but if you're resourceful enough to get it done, if you're financing equity, due diligence, structuring the deal, negotiating that structure with your first group of investors, and then after that you just dictate the structure, 
um, and you know, make sure that it's fair for everybody. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you're going to have to learn, but if you're resourceful, then you're going to be able to make it happen. And I'd say tactically, the podcast, as you mentioned earlier, it's the world's longest real estate podcast. And it's crazy how the amount of friendships I've made that have resulted into business relationships. Uh, specifically, I have met people from the podcast. They've reached out to me. We've gotten to know each other. And then through those relationships, I've raised over $800,000 uh, for my deals just through those relationships uh, after getting to know them and making sure they're accredited investors, etc. So um, just that alone has made the podcast worth it. But then you compound, you know, the lessons I learn on a daily basis speaking to guests, and it's, you know, it's 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 crazy how how beneficial it's been. I, I think one thing you mentioned in terms of your success too, uh, and one thing that I noticed in you too is that you're very goal oriented, and you set your goals high, and you and you stick by them, and you and you plug people into what you're doing to hold you accountable. And I think that uh, you know that's that's a really important aspect is just the planning, planning out what your goals are for uh, that month, for that week, uh, for that year, and uh, really sticking to them and aiming high. And I think it's paid off for you, not only in your real estate career, but your podcast, which again is one of the leading podcasts out there for real estate investing and in a lot of other endeavors you have in your life. Uh, so I really appreciate you in sharing that. Uh, one of the things I want to look at here is in terms of uh, advice for the folks that are listening to this. Uh, some of them may say, gee whiz, you know, this guy just jumped in 168 units. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable even investing in single family homes right now. Um, what kind of encouragement can you give them in terms of jumping into uh, real estate investing and, uh, you know, maybe starting off with multifamilies? Well, it, it totally depends on who we're talking to and what your experience is, but I'll I'll tell you a couple things. One is um, the best way to approach it, for, at least for me, and I suspect for anybody listening, is to establish the baseline foundation of knowledge. So one is just get educated. Um, how I do it is I read a bunch of books, and that's how I learn. Um, then I reach out to the authors too and, and attempt to get to know them. It's a lot easier for me now since I have a podcast and then I just simply interview them. Um, did that with Oren Claff, the author of Pitch Anything, which is just a paradigm breaking book on investor conversations. Uh, highly recommend it. And so the first thing is get, no get, get the knowledge. Um, once you get the knowledge, then go do it. If you're and when you when you attempt to go do it, you'll reach the roadblocks, and then you bring along people who are doing it and can help you uh, take it to the next level. But I recommend learning and then doing, and then see where your gaps are, because at that point you'll identify. Okay, this is what I really need to focus on. This is what I need to bring someone in to help me with, um, because if you just immediately look for a mentor or consultant and you haven't read the 10 books that you need to read, then you're wasting your money because they're likely going to be expensive and you're not uh, able to get going as quickly as though as if you had um, compared to if you had read the stuff. So uh, one thing I would offer is I have a, a resources guide with the different books I recommend on apartment investing, different websites, they're all, I think they're all free. Um, I don't make any money off of it if they're not. Um, but all these different websites that I go to to check stuff out, uh, podcasts, I need to add yours in there, Bill. Um, I will. Uh, awesome. Eventually, once I, once I update it. Yeah, different podcasts to check out. So if all you gotta do is text, text BEST, B-E-S-T, to the number 38470. That's text the word BEST, B-E-S-T, to the number 38470 best BEST 38470 and you'll put in your email address and uh, after you get the text back and then um, it will send you the resources guide um, and then you also get uh, my weekly newsletter where I summarize the tips that I learned from my daily real estate podcast and that will be another way to get educated on this stuff.
Yeah, that's great. And for those of you that were listening that maybe didn't jot it down, it will be in the show notes. So you'll be able to uh, to get that information so you can text. And that sounds like a great, a great resource. Awesome. A couple more questions here, and then we'll go to our, our wrap-up session. Uh, just looking at your current business, what is the one thing that's really exciting you about your business today? All roads lead back to my podcast, quite frankly. I've looked at it, and I, I've seen what it does, the influence I have um, through the podcast, the relationships I'm building with people while I'm sleeping um, because they're listening to it all hours of the night or in the morning or whenever all across the world. Uh, it, it's, it's clear to me that that's the number one thing that is helping me and propelling me to the next level. Um, you know, I, I have a 320 unit under contract and we're going to close on it in about three months, a little bit less than three months. And it's going to be the third purchase I've made in the last, what, eight months, nine months, um, a 250, 155, and this will be a 320. So, wow. the, the, and the reason why is because I'm able to, um, you know, just, just continue to be a higher profile, uh, investor and getting no more and more people through my podcast and also through in-person stuff too. Um, and it's, it's been really helpful. So, you know, there's a lot of things I could mention. Um, but I'd say number one, all roads lead back to the podcast. I'm putting a big emphasis on that in 2016. Oh, that's great. And, and what vision do you have for the future of your company? Uh, I anticipate acquiring multifamily properties, um, and then, just acquiring them until we get to a billion dollars worth of properties under our control. Um, and then taking a step back and seeing where we're at. Great, great goal. <laughs> I had set the goal of a thousand doors in six years and it looks like you're going to have it in probably three or four years. Uh, it's just amazing what you're doing, Joe. Wrap up session. Move into our wrap up section here, and we just ask you a series of quick questions and uh, uh, respond yeah, as quickly as you can, and uh, <laughs> then we'll go from there. Okay, and then, then there's one question that you can take your time on, uh, sort of a final question. Great, listeners. Okay, uh, favorite real estate book? I'd say it is the Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings by Steve Burgess. Favorite business book? Crucial Conversations. A most valuable website for your business. Um, most value, that's not my own. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's besides that's, your own. Yeah, I, should, I should clarify. Yeah, clarify. Mine, mine's pretty helpful. Um, <laughs> I'd say Bigger Pockets. Favorite internet resources or apps. Uh, you may be emphasizing more on the app side of the things that you would use on a regular basis again for investing. Well, I'd say Quotiful. My friend, um, uh, my friend actually created the app, and it's it like it's like Instagram for quotes. Uh, the reason why I say that is because it gives me inspiration every morning at 9 a.m. on my phone. I pop that, it sends it to me, I, I read the quote, look at it, and then keep on going about my day. Oh, that's exciting, I haven't heard of that one before, that's great. Um, and now the last one is, uh, really again, we're, we're looking at our audience, we've, uh, we've got folks that are, uh, some that may be already in, in uh, real estate investing, others starting out, some considering it. If you could start over, um, knowing what you know now, and let's say you had only $1,000, what would you do to launch your real estate investing business? Start a podcast. Wow. Yeah, I'd start a podcast, buy, buy a computer, buy a mic, buy a subscription to um, what Libsyn, and then um, just start talking. I buy one of these little recorder apps probably in total if you know depending on the computer but probably all of that's going to cost 500 600 bucks uh because the computer is going to probably be about 500 of that and um then just start a podcast interview people every day just like i do now um build a network build an influence of 
you know, build, build people that um, build a, a group of people you influence and then just keep on moving up the food chain. Wow, great. Great uh, advice, great great information. Uh, Joe, it has been a blast having you on, and uh, especially on our very first podcast. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Uh, there was one other thing you're, you're actually supposed to uh, do. <laughs> All right. That was great, Joe. We're going you know, to tag that on the end of this year. <laughs> I love it. I, I was looking forward to the whole time. I don't. You weren't gonna, I wasn't going to let you off the hook for that. <laughs> All right, Joe. Well, thank you so much. And for those of you listening, how can people get a hold of you? How can they they uh, find out more about you? Well, you can just Google me, Joe Fairless, and my website will come up. Or um, you know, to get that free uh, guide to um, you know, apartment investing, just text best three eight four seven zero. Um, or I also have a money raising spreadsheet that I'd be happy to send you. Um, it's how I structure the investors, um, whenever I'm raising money. Um, and you can email me info, I N F O at Joe Just mention that you heard me talk about it in this, uh, on this podcast and I'd be happy to share it with you. Oh, fantastic, Joe. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, everybody, you got to listen to the best uh, uh, best ever real estate investing uh, podcast. And uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big big fan. Listen to Joe all the time. And uh, he has some amazing guests. And I think you could get fully educated just listening to your show seven days a week, which is amazing. Just to thank you uh, for all you're doing and uh, look forward to talking to you later, Joe. All right. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, Bill. All right. Thank you. Have a blessed day. I just wanted to take a moment just to thank you so much for coming by and listening to our broadcast here at the Old Dogs REI Network. We really appreciate it. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing with your time right now. And the fact that you have chosen to come here and listen to our podcast, we are very appreciative. Um, as you know, we're a new broadcast, and we really want to get the word out and let people know what we're doing. So hopefully we can be a, a resource to help those that are pre-retirement or retiring that are looking for ways to build their cash flow. Uh, one of the best ways that you could help us out is to go to iTunes, look up Old Dogs REI Network, and that's spelled D-A-W-G, and subscribe to the podcast, listen to a podcast or two, uh, rate them uh, a five-star rating and leave a review, write a little review, and we'll be monitoring those and reading them every now and then on the show as well. Uh, you could take the time to do that. We would really be grateful. Thank you so much, and have a great day.